That symbol follows all the way from the beginning in Genesis, all the way through the flood, all the way to Revelation. It's only appropriate that that symbol begin to take its rise again as you lead towards the end. So we're about to take a journey into the pre-flood world, to Revelation, to Nimrod. And we're also about to fall straight off the edge of this thing right here. Atlantis is a prefiguring of the entire pre-flood world. It's not just a city. It could have been that as well. But in the, this is the entirety of the ancient world. You need a Garden of Eden style world for your ancient past. That's what you're really looking at. And what did Atlantis have? Why were its tropical trees and its fruits and its, all of its animals were weird and exotic and like mixtures of animals and things? And of course you have hundreds, it really it's thousands of flood legends all around the globe. And they become the more precise the closer you get to the event. And the Epic of Gilgamesh, as is seen in my hand right there. That puppy, boy that looks nice, doesn't it? That's a recreation. That puppy definitely covers the pre-flood world right there. Underneath the ground were large pockets of water in the legend of Atlantis, which provided for those amazing Garden of Eden style environments on the surface of the planet. In ancient China, you have the legend of Nua and Fuxi, and they even put a date to it. They believe that the flood occurred in 2952 BC. We're gonna fall off of the edge of this? Yes, sir. Okay. Oh my We're gonna God. drop 150 feet. Going Dude, about miles bring the out. camera over here and take a look at this. This is evil. The pterodactyl. We're gonna take a journey into the pre-flood world. We're gonna be falling straight down. Is this thing safe today? You think so? You sure? Absolutely, okay. All right, before we get to ancient bloodlines, these are the three sons of Noah on the screen right here. And by the way, one would literally expect to find massive building projects that bedazzle and amaze us coming right through the lineage of a family like this. This is an actual Sumerian document that I'm holding in my hand. This is a, from the legend of Enmerker and the Lord of Arata. Lord of Arata is Noah from the mountains, the Ararat Mountains. We're going to be talking in this thing about time, space, and matter. In Merkur, the name in Merkur, the Kar, the name in Merkur, from these texts, well, Kar means mighty hunter. Just like in the book of Genesis, God calls Nimrod the mighty hunter against God. What you're looking at right here is a walk through the book of Eden, all of the pertinent parts of the beginning of history. It, what it really is, is it's a tracking of both darkness and light. So using a mixture of the Sumerian text, using a mixture, all the texts they told you not to read, all of the things they told you not to look at, and approving that all those things were real. Parts here, you're looking at Genesis 6 and Enoch 6, which by the way, both cover the fall of the angels. Isn't that just magical? Or focusing on the Hebrew symbols, the pre-flood Hebrew symbols that go atop that pyramid. It's important for us to realize that all Hebrew symbols have not only a meaning. So the most quoted line in the English, all of literature, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, those three words are these six pre-Canaanite, the really pre-flood pre-flood symbols. One, two, three, four, five, six. Hebrew symbols from before the flood. You may find that this matches sort of identically with your six. Now you really have seven, many would call this Rome phase two, but up to leading to the crucifixion on the cross of Jesus Christ following the flood, our written records as well as the archeological evidence give us six ages of empires starting right there where the first little tower rose Nimrod would have been a Sumerian Assyrian right there in the same area where every written record on earth pretty much every written record on earth that covers the flood from the Eridu Genesis to the book of Genesis to the legend of Nua and Fushi tells you that the boat that saved all mankind landed 
six ages of empires. We have the Assyrians, that would equal the Sumerians, the Assyrians in that package. You have the Egyptians, Babylonians, Persians, Greeks, and Romans. It was under the Romans that Jesus died following that flood. Well, if I hop back over here to the words in the beginning or Bereshit, we start with the, the Hebrew Bet, the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And of course, these six symbols as well, you start with the Bet and then one, two, three, four, five, six, and you're at the last letter, the 22nd letter of the Hebrew alphabet, the cross, which means sign or mark. Now, in fancy magazines and modern literature, you have the drop cap, like the I on In the Beginning. Well, the first place they got that is out of old King James Bibles, like this one right here. And where they got that was in old copies of the Torah from the Hebrews. And where they got that is that's the way they believed that Moses got it on top of the mountain. Now the first letter, it's commonly said that the book of Genesis, or the entirety of the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation and everything between, is a tale of two cities. I'm going to take it a step further than that. What you're looking at is a tale of two trees. Now what the rabbis will tell you is that whatever symbol starts a paragraph, a sentence, or a whole page, or the entire book, from Genesis to Revelation and everything between should give you some indication of what the entire text is going to be about. Well, in the case of that giant emphasized bet that starts the book of Genesis, well that bet, that's the symbol for home. So everything you're reading from Genesis to Revelation is about home. But stepping from there to our ion, the ion is the number 70. Israel, when Joseph's family entered Egypt, they entered a family and there were 70 of them. They entered a family and they left a nation. Now, speaking of sets of six that end with a cross, just like man was created on the sixth day, I guess that brings us to the the Vav, the sixth letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Now, what the rabbis will tell you, in any genuine or authentic Torah, ancient Torah, the Vav, each scripture is going to start with a Vav. That's because the rabbis believe this is the only symbol that connects heaven to earth. What they're really stating with that is that man consciously plugged in, built entirely out of genetic digital coding, the software coding of life itself, and running loose in this place in his biological spacesuit. Man, the Vav, number six, is the connecting piece between heaven and earth. Okay, I guess we're going on a journey. Mm -hmm. An air balloon, yeah. top of the world in the Nile. Hey guys, here comes the fun part. Okay. That is the ground. If you do not like it, suck the, it up, buddy. This chair I don't care. is about Five, to fall straight down, four. and here we go. So this little guy right here, pterodactyl. You actually have reports where you have some of these creatures that, I don't know if they're true or not, but in pockets of the deep jungle, you have reports of sightings of these guys. God spends more time talking about what he did in the lives of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, each one individually, than he does on the entire creation of the world. At the end of the book of Genesis, Mankind is in a desert and is about to be starving. And the man they're going to turn to, Joseph, is a man in the bottom of the Pharaoh's cage who is listening to the Creator. For 30, 40 years ago, you even have reports that come out of San Antonio, Texas. The symbol of the iron can either be light on the right hand 
or it can be dark on the left hand. And if the eye be darkness, then how great is that darkness? That passage comes from Matthew 6, 24. That's a heavy number of authority, by the way. Now at the one, two, three, four, five, six, the cross, there were three vaws. I mean, that's the symbol for the nails. There was one in each hand and one in the feet. Three vaws on that cross. The symbol for the ion, the number 70, the pre-flood symbol ion, represents light on one side. In the book of Genesis, the primeval light of God from Genesis 1, 3 in the book of Genesis. And the first place we see the iron become dim or going towards darkness. Well, that would be in Genesis 3. Notice it's the Vav going back there. I didn't determine that. Genesis 3, where God made garments of skin. And the word skin makes use of the iron in that passage. Now, the Great Pyramid is covered with 144,000 casting stones, so it's believed to be. Now, that's not a throwback to the book of Revelation. I don't know what would be. You have three pyramids that would all be in a perfect row. They're shaped like Orion's belt because the one on the left-hand side is askew. Notice that one path goes up like it's headed towards heaven and the other path goes down like it's headed towards hell. Whether that was intentional or not, the symbolism is fascinating. 153 feet, that's exactly how many fish that Jesus brought in. Go look at the mathematical properties of the number 153. The Grand Gallery, of course, has an empty tomb inside of it. Joseph, the prefiguring, these pyramids, we're going to be making the case to you, that these pyramids are all a symbol of Joseph. More than that, it's a symbol of God. In fact, the pyramid directly in the center that looks the largest is actually, the appearance of it being larger is actually an illusion. So the Great Pyramid is the one right next to it that's in line with it. The other pyramid, which is smaller, is actually punier, as you look up here at the top, and it's askew, it's out of line, just like the thieves at the cross. The one on the right said, Lord, if you be who they say you are, would you even remember me? Think how weak that is. Would you even remember me in your kingdom? His hands are nailed to a cross. There's nothing he can do, no work he can do that can save him. He just believed, even a wimpy belief in Jesus. Jesus did not reply, wimpy. He said, assuredly, this day you shall be with me in paradise. The thief on the left, they're both thieves, they don't even get a name. The thief on the left, he's mocking, at Je both were mocking at the start. One changed his heart, the one on the right. The one on the left mocked all the way to his death. Up here at the pyramids, you have two here, and the one that's little bitty and puny, the one that's askew is that left pyramid. Just like the two thieves on the cross, light and dark. And of course, the top of the pyramid up here is missing its, its iron, its capstone. Almost as if, symbolically speaking, there's some kind of a war about what eye should peer from a top that ancient structure right there. No one really knows where the capstone went. Now, aside from all that, the reason why that these pyramids are commonly compared to Orion's belt is because that alignment with the askew one at the side matches up with Orion's belt. Whether that's by chance, accidental, or God did it, men knew or didn't know, I find it fascinating. Here's these three. There's Orion's belt. And of course, Orion's belt is part of the constellation, part of the zodiac of the mighty hunter. So those askew stars are part of the askew hunter, which of course brings us to Nimrod, the first eye atop a tower. And I absolutely assure you, your first Nimrod is a foreshadowing of your much larger last Nimrod. 
Right now we're inside of cliff dwellings leading towards all of these ritual ceremony sites. So we're going to be coming inside of coming inside of where we take a tour through the pre-flood world. This is an Indian cliff dwelling. Here in the ancient room of is this is an ancient kiva. And inside of these, we're in some mesa cliff dwellings on the edge of the canyons. This is where Indians were. This is specifically where spirits would come out from. Now, part of the way that that happens, just like we cover in pre-flood, just like we cover in a lot of this stuff. The back of that looks pretty rocking, doesn't it? Uh, such as the weird things that you also find around ritual sites in the ancient world. Trust me, we go through that in this book here. And in entities. When you're taking the ayahuasca, the peyote, these different magical plants. That right there is called lamb. That's the first drawing in history of what they call today a gray alien. It was drawn by Aleister Crowley. It was a being that he said looked like a Babylonian, trafficked with a Babylonian king. I got it in the book Nimrod. He said that creature right there would step out of thin air when he summons it. Just like over here, Manly P. Hall said he would summons the Yoda, a wisdom spirit. An amphibious, reptilian-looking spirit, which would magically appear. What's only inside the magic circle? Are you willing to talk about it? I know you, look, just, just admit, just admit, we all know the stories you were making up. Can you just say you're sorry? Can you say you're sorry? Okay, see, you know, that's a friendly thing to do. <laughs> well, that will let you make entrance to the spirit world. Or people that have sleep paralysis, and they believe something's in the room with them. When you take the ayahuasca, then all of a sudden the, the entities appear. The aliens that come out from another realm. He is, this is, okay, so te, can you tell me about it? It's a Mahakala. Okay, what does he mean though? I think he's a god of power. He's a power god. Uh -huh. Is he real? Uh huh. He, I mean, no, no, no. I mean, really, in in reality. Yeah, yeah. So the, we worship him. Okay. What does? How does he? Can he manifest? There's my friend Mike Hughes touching the top of the pyramid right there. If the eye peering from the top of the pyramid can go on a dollar bill, then certainly a Joseph coin for 2020, made by Mike, by the way. He felt that compelled that this is a Joseph period. What are these on him? Is it, this is a third eye? Yeah, that's the third eye. Okay, so what does the third eye do? In this video you're watching now, exactly zero glory gets to go to ugly, wiggly little devils. All glory. So the third eye, he can see through <laughs> realms and things. So, and he's three grand which give all glory to the Lord God of the universe. It's a Joseph coin right there. For these videos and every video from God in the nutshell, goes to, well, just like it says right on the back of this coin, yod heh vav -He, God himself, the creator of the universe, my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Everything is covered by the blood of Jesus. Welcome to the Joseph period. And that right up there behind me, that's the pre-flood balancing rock in Colorado. We're talking about the pre-flood world. Can you talk to us about it? Can you share some information about it? Can you come here? Joseph himself, and I've often referred to this time period that you're in right now as a Joseph period. That's a time of prosper. You need the time of prosper for the pagans to be able to come in later, take that prosper, use it against God, and go to their tribulation. The eye can either be light or dark. After pre-flood, Nimrod, and when it says turn the cover on the top, that's because it looks like that on the back. Well, they think we have food. I feel so bad. You are on part one of a three-part set journey into the pre-flood world. Speaking of the ancient world, these dudes that I have in this little box right here are called Triops. And here's one of these guys right here. Claimed to be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of years old. These are living fossils, is what they are, that are found identical today as they were way back in the ancient world. The same class of things, they are the same things. These are the great grandbabies of the trilobites. Trilobites, which you have 
plastered and sandblasted into walls and canyons and in every layer of strata underneath the ground. Like a day of catastrophe of water smashed this planet Earth. Well, these are their great, 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 great grandchildren sold in this box here at Walmart for 10 bucks. These are the smaller, wimpier versions of the trilobites that you find in the walls. Just like everything here is declining, including us and all of the animals. The elephants were mammoths in the ancient world. Everything here is going downhill, including the ancestors of the trilobites, or the great-great-grandchildren of the trilobites. And in that same line of thing, here are horseshoe crabs found in fossils, just like just like these fossil fish right here are identical today as they are in this rock. These evolutionists used to claim and tell all of us that they were, well, they, they still do, 300, 500 million years old, strangely immune to evolution, like hundreds and thousands of other things. Evolutionists believe these were extinct hundreds of millions of years ago. To put that in perspective, that's older by hundreds of millions of years than your dinosaurs. Well, until evolutionists visited restaurants in China, where the Chinese were totally unaware they were extinct, and only in the fossil record, as they were serving them in restaurants in China, Malaysia, Thailand. The emperor of China, by the way, there are records, and there are all sorts of records like this, particularly that come out of China. You have bulks of dinosaur bones that come out of there. Claimed that some of his chariots were pulled by Triceratops. It's hard to claim that before Triceratops is discovered. And we're also in this thing, going to be trying to talk about time, space, and matter. I think it's only appropriate, since we're going pre-flood in this, to start with the words from the book of Genesis. The names in that book. You have ten names from Adam to Noah to the time of the flood. Just like you have ten plagues of Egypt, ten commandments, ten the Yod, which is like a thought that dangles between heaven and earth is a number of completion. It's a universal whole number. These are the 10 names. They begin with Adam. Each name has a direct meaning. There is, you'd have an impossible time convincing me some rabbis concocted this in the Genesis text. Adam, Adam, it means man. Seth, appointed mortal sorrow. Man, appointed mortal sorrow. The blessed God shall come down teaching. That's Enoch's name. He was the seventh from Adam. When he let, he was not, for God took him. When he left, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Came down teaching. His death, whose death? God's death shall bring the despairing. That's you and I. Rest and comfort. By the way, Methuselah, whose name means his death shall bring, his death shall bring the judgment. He died the very year, or seven days, before that flood. But to get into this, to really get in and understand our eyes atop the pyramids, I think it's important that we know a little bit about, since Egypt is a foreshadowing of Revelation, to really look at the Exodus, we've got to understand just a little bit about Egypt, particularly ancient Egypt. This is all pre-flood. In fact, this is your timeline of where we're going right this second in this video. In fact, we're not going to start way back at the pre-flood world in the day that the rocks jetted straight up out of Earth. We're going to come forward through Nimrod, forward through the Exodus, and start at the hour of the pyramids with the eye on top, right in this video, beginning now. Of course, we know that our current maps of Egypt were drawn by Berkeley-style university professors because, well, you've got Upper Egypt down here and Lower Egypt at the top, up there. Your current timelines of Egyptian history look a little something like what I have on the screen back here. The first little seedlet of Egypt, right here in the first dynasty, is King Narmer, depicted on what's called the Narmer palette right here. At the top of the Narmer palette, you have one of the first gods of Egypt, or at least the god that he thought to portray the most prominently. This character here with the horns coming off the top of its head. And King Narmer is pretty much, well, 
like all of the little bitty sprinkles of kingships that began to develop, dropping right down along the fertile land down in here in what would become Egypt, and also over in here in what would become Babylon from Ur, Uruk, Cush, Babylon, and Nineveh. And of course, the little settlement and warlord of Eridu were the tallest and first ziggurat, the ziggurat of Eridu, often called the biblical Tower of Babel. The ziggurat of Eridu, which is a real and actual place and thing, would in fact have been not only the oldest, well, probably the oldest ziggurat in the world, but also the largest. Seen here on the screen, somehow it was shaken to its very base. But no one would argue that King Narmer of Dynasty One was just a little bitty warlord. This goes on from the first dynasty of Egypt under Narmer until something unusual happens in Dynasty Three under King Djoser. He has a very mysterious visor named Imhotep, the magic man of Egyptian history who would build the first step pyramid of Egypt right down in here with scaffolding we're walking under which this guy here really isn't supposed to be taking us through I guess or so he claimed. These are the pages that deal with Imhotep and Joseph. These are called cartouches or the names of the of the pharaohs. The names of pharaohs are in cartouches. I, I have been waiting for years to go through all these parts and I'm, I'm giving away some secrets in this pre-flood video here about the exodus but don't worry about that. Egypt has plenty of secrets to give. Imhotep, compared right here on this page to Joseph, the things you learn about the cartouches. This is a Joseph coin. And on the back of that coin, the magic man that made the wealth of all Egypt. Well, there's his grain storage facilities right there. And you're in the year 2020. That's Imhotep, i.e. Joseph, on the front of that coin right there. This step pyramid was built by King Djoser of the Third Dynasty, and his visor, Imhotep, it's an important name, Imhotep, was revered through all of the ages of Egyptian history. In the same general area, just a few miles in fact, or a few kilometers in fact, from where the Great Pyramid or the Pyramids of Giza, including the Sphinx, would later be built. More than this, that step pyramid complex in Dynasty Three, under built by Imhotep, under King Djoser, would actually be the model for the pyramids that would come. The Great Pyramid of Giza, built by Khufu, which is in the fourth dynasty of Egyptian history. Now, speaking of Egyptian history, all of your current timelines of Egyptian history come from. This guy here with the star occultic pagan thing on top of his head called Mantho or Manitho. You say tomato, I say tomato. This man's timelines are not only the basis for all current dynasties of Egypt and their timelines for all of your secular universities, but not only that, they've used the timelines from this guy and his Egyptian history as the underpinning of what you are basing your current world history on. This guy's documents. Manetho, he was a priest of Egypt, actually during the time of the Greeks who believed in this guy here, the Greek god Pan with the two little double horns on top of his head. Egypt had been conquered by Alexander the Great and largely become a joke. You're gonna find the Kokopelli who plays the flute is always by these these kivas, these Indian places always playing his flute. Well, Pan, the god Pan, plays his flute, and the flute comes. This not that playing the flute's bad. This is the Pied Piper story where the children are gonna follow, but they're gonna drown in the water in the Abzu, the abyss. But they followed the Pied Piper, the magical Pied Piper, and they all listened and didn't think. In fact, Alexander had declared himself as Pharaoh, but nonetheless, the priests of Egypt began under Alexander the Great. Well, Alexander the Great was putting together all of the historical and religious texts of the entire world. That included Manetho, who gave us the Egyptian timeline upon which 
we today have based our entire world history timeline. But let's give him a shot. The uppity ups and the university professors back there drinking their brandy think that Manitho is the most trustworthy guy on the planet Earth. Let's give him a shot. First of all, the name Manitho means the truth of Thoth. With a name like that, we know it's got to be solid. Okay, so let's take a look here at uh, Manitho or the Truth of Thoth's document upon which we've based all of current world history from our most Ivy League universities. Well, he states to us, right in the opener, no less. So all of your, your world history today is based on the writings of the pagan priest Manitho, a priest of Thoth, during the time of the Greeks. Gave you, with the secular guys use it, all of your universities. For Egyptian history is based on the writings of Manitho. It was document that uh, we're going to have a total of 969 years. Let's see, Kronos, the god Kronos, ruled for 401 years. Now, I actually made a mistake in the video that you're watching. We stated that Kronos ruled for 401 years. It's actually 40 years, so I didn't want to upset any Kronos fans. I want to correct that where I'm standing in the Kiva. And just to be clear about this, according to the Greeks, Kronos came from Uranus. He says after this that uh, Osiris and Isis ruled for 35 years. Typhoon, the god Typhoon for 29 years. So your world history right now, today, that you're going to learn in any university is based on Egyptian history or what they claim is Egyptian history. Based on the writings of the pagan priest, Manitho, priest of Thoth. Ores, of course, ruled for 20 years according to his document. And the Ores ruled for, of course, 23 years. This has sounded rock solid to me. Let's look some more. Now, here's the funny thing is that in Egypt, you always have Upper Egypt, which is at the bottom, and Lower Egypt, which is at the top. So you have two different sets of pharaohs, even of gods and goddesses, going at any given time in Egyptian history, which means that that history is about half as long as the timeline that you see right here. He goes on to state that, uh, well, Anubis, the Egyptian god Anubis, ruled for 17 years. Right after that, Hercules. Hercules ruled for 15 years. Here he's got Apollo. Apollo for 25 years. Amon for 30. Tythos for 27. Sosos 32. And, of course, right down here at the bottom, he's got uh, big old god Zeus down there for 20 years. Now, let me ask you university guys that, because you're a lot smarter than I am. When you're looking at this list, upon which you have based all of Egyptian history and all of world history on top of that. Now, here's my question, guys. Here's my question. Because you always say that those timelines are just unstretchable. They're rock solid. They're in your hand rock solid. So let me ask you this. Is there a possibility in your mind, because Hercules seemed to me like a pretty strong dude, are you absolutely certain that he only ruled for 15 years? I mean, he's not tougher than Anubis, who it says here ruled for 17? Or, or let me give you another practical example, guys. I mean, you're all hardcore atheist secular professors that are out there pitching these timelines as absolutely rock solid, nailed to the wall, airtight. So let me pose this for you. Zeus, that's the thunder god that throws the lightning bolts from the sky. Manetto has got him down here for only 20 years. Are you kidding me? That's all that Zeus gets, according to you fellas? I don't know. I don't know if I can trust this list. Now, of course, here's the truth, but it's not the truth from Thoth. Well, what they've actually done is, well, taken what they've liked and left the rest and pushed it aside. The problem is that you can't do that, guys. Because when Manitho is telling you that he believes that Hercules ruled for 15 years, that's equally as real to him as when he's telling you about Ramsey II, King Tut, Akhenaten, Tuthmosis III, Imhotep, the Djoser, Kofu, or Narmer. And more than that, what he's actually copying those documents largely from is the largest pharaoh and most powerful pharaoh and most religious pharaoh that ever lived, breathed, or walked on the face of this earth. The pharaoh that you guys yourselves in Egyptology call the Napoleon of all Egypt. That's who Manitho largely based his timelines and his chronology and the dynasties of Egypt off of. And more than that, it was that same king, Tuthmosis III, that is largely, he is responsible. 
takes the most credit for the Book of the Dead. In fact, all occult today traces its power back to that man upon which that your lists for your current world timelines are entirely based on. But that brings up an interesting point. Let's take a look at what Manetho was actually writing. Sometimes I think you guys don't actually read some of the stuff or a lot of the stuff, maybe any of the stuff that you actually pitch forth. You're too busy back there sucking down your brandy, sitting in your fancy university chairs. Let me read you what Manetho believed about the history of Egypt. If you guys in the major universities get to pick and choose what you like and what you don't like, what you get to keep and what you don't get to keep to put together your timelines of all in world history, then I get to do it too. The only difference between, I guess, me and you, I guess, is that I'm actually going to read to you what your guy actually said. Here we go. Oh, look at this. What a surprise. Starting in verse 6, no less. From the creation of Adam, indeed, down to Enoch. Isn't that something? He brings up Enoch in this. To the general cosmic year 1282, the number of days was known in neither month nor year, but the egregory, or the watchers. That would come out of the book of Enoch as well, wouldn't it? Sounds like this guy had a copy who had held and conversed with men, the watchers, the fallen angels or fallen stars, had conversed with men and taught them that the orbits of the two luminaries being marked with the 12 signs of the zodiac are composed of, uh-oh, down here, what does it say? 360 parts. Now, let me think. Where, where have I heard that before? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. In the book of Enoch, in the book of the luminaries, Enoch's calendar has 360 days with four days of remembrance. Those four days belong to God. That's why Daniel's prophecy is based on a 360 day year because the extra four days already belong to God. So whether he's going to bless you or curse you, those four days belong to him. He's doing it on a 360 day year. But hopping back over to Manetho, oh, you're going to love this. Mestraim, or that would be Mesraim in the Bible from Genesis 10, lived not long after the flood. For after the flood, Cham, he means Ham there, that would be the biblical son of Noah, which he actually specifies in his text, began Egyptus, this is where you get the word Egypt from, or Mesraim, who lived not long after the flood, right here, who was the first to set out to establish himself in Egypt at the time when the tribes began to disperse this way and that. Now, the whole time from Adam to the flood, oh my gosh, this cannot be good for you. These are hardcore atheist university professors that are pitching me as this guy being the inventor of our timelines for Egyptian history upon which we put our time timelines for world history, and he's telling you right here verbatim, from Adam to the flood, according to him, was 2,242 years. Am I missing something here, guys? This is the history that you guys wanted to use for our world. Now, when he says the dispersion this way and that, he means from here at the ziggurat of Eridu, otherwise known in the Bible as the Tower of Babel covered here in the Eridu Genesis text, that's what it's called, which covers the event and goes a step further in the documentation by stating that after the flood, the kingship, this is a god kingship that came down, that's really what Manito is referring to with Hercules and Zeus and Anubis and all these names and the Egyptian gods, talking about pre-flood things that came in, just like Enoch was. After the flood, when the kingship from heaven was lowered, the kingship was in Eridu. What are they talking about there? Let me show you. Well, right here on this document, Lord Arata, that stands for Mount Ararat, where the boat that saved all mankind is said to have landed, is having issues with Enmerkor, or the biblical Nimrod in the text. And what he writes is this. This is Enmerkor, who's having trouble getting Lord Arata, who lives up in the mountains, to give offerings to his pagan gods in support of his newly building tower project. And he states this, Enki, the wise and knowing Lord of the earth, this is one of your oldest documents on the planet, shall bring back 
the speech, the tongues were confused at the Tower of Babel. The word Babel actually means Babel. Shall bring back the speech in their mouths so that the speech of mankind is truly again one. And who is the Yankee? Well, of course, he's this little dude here. And these wavy lines represent a dimensional portal in which he's stepping up into all reality out of because he's been summoned right at Eridu, where the Tower of Babel was, just like it's clearly and distinctly specified in pretty well, all, not just the Bible, pretty well all of your original documents of this planet Earth. So as Manetho continues by telling us, beginning in 12, notice the things that the devil thought is not yod he vav he 12. 12 is a number of authority to God. It's the number he uses. The zodiac has an equal number of parts, 360. You got that from Enoch. But he got it filtered through who? And the reigns of the gods who ruled among them for six generations in six dynasties. He's talking about prior to the flood. Covered, of course, is the Egyptian Nu or Abyss. The boat that saved all mankind and the long lifespans covered not just in the biblical text but right here in the Epic of Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh, whose father was the unseen one, ruled for 126 years. Empires right falling down over here, beginning with the Tower of Babel on this side over here, where you see massive ziggurats beginning to form, and the inception of Babylon. By the way, Gilgamesh claimed that he was part man, part God, and part something else. And of course, the Sumerian Kings list places the flood in anywhere between 3000 and 3500 BC. Same Kings list that also covers the flood from the Sumerian or Babylonian Assyrian side putting these kings prior to the flood with enormous lifespans. Now let me ask you something about this particular document. Not this similar to the occult of the Egyptian stuff. Does this particular king's list, does it look like it's got a lot of, I mean that's three sets of sixes right there, isn't it? Heading back over to our empires that are the size of modern day super Walmarts. What Manito is actually copying here comes from the perspective of Nimrod right over here through Cush and up through Ham who was the son that Noah put the curse on and that's according to his own words right here when he says Mistraim lived not long after the flood for after the flood Shem or he means Ham that's who Nimrod came through or in Markar the son of Noah begat Egyptus or Mizraim who was the first to set out to establish himself in Egypt and Mantos is writing you in his document exactly what he's starting with right here a history of Egypt that comes through Ham, the cursed son, through Nimrod, who built the tower and summons the Inki, and also goes by the name of Nimrod, being depicted right here with the same star being depicted right on the forehead with the third eye or the Urias, the serpent goes on Manetho's head, whose wife was the infamous goddess with the moon on her head, Simiramses and Simiramses or Semiramis. Her name in the ancient world is going to be Inanna. In the, in the Sumerian epics, she'll be Inanna in ancient Sumeria. Who Inanna really is, the moon goddess with the moon over her head. Who she really is, this is, it's Utu, it's Ham, the rebellious son of Noah. It's Ham's spoiled granddaughter, his spoiled whiny bratty granddaughter. That's why Inanna's name is on all the ancient temples. And Nimrod, her husband, who's also her brother. The wife, she is also the wife of Nimrod. And uh, she's very evil too. There's Lilith and her combinations with Inanna and Ishtar and ancient Lilith, Genesis and Enoch 6. And of course, Enoch 69, and that deals with abortion and Planned Parenthood, the modern altars 
proper sacrifice in your modern age, which is almost appropriate to be talking about that in a kiva standing right here. And here are your Machu Picchu temples, where they would cut the heart out and sacrifice you to their, to their god, the dragon waiting on the other side, the quasi kettle, the feathered serpent, the flying serpent, the god of the air, where you find all of these strange skulls whose child was the part god, part man union, called Tammuz, the goat. All of your ancient cultures were looking up at the stars, particularly in Sumerian. That's true, isn't it? He says that's true. Utu in Sumerian is Ham, one of Noah's three sons. Utu, or the Shemesh, and this would come from the Sumerian documents. This is actually Utu is Ham, the third son of Noah often represented, he was the beginning representation of the sun god in the ancient world. You have Cush, and then you get down a little ways down, you get down to Nimrod. Nimrod, in a Sumerian text, is in Merkur. The car, and in Merkur, means mighty hunter. Just like in Genesis, God calls Nimrod the mighty hunter against the Lord. The Akapelu. All of it's in these books. The War of Noah. I bet you even never thought of such a thing. You know that's covered from Nimrod's side? The War of Noah. Nimrod literally covers in those texts that while he's going to war on his great-grandfather Noah, that Noah is up in the mountains, has fortified with thorns, and is releasing ancient dragons on Nimrod and his men. And the dragons are eating Nimrod's men, and Nimrod covers that he's upset about this. We'll be going through that heavily in Nimrod, both the book and the movie. Did you eat some of Nimrod's men? And Nana, all of these people, including Nimrod, Gilgamesh, Gilgamesh's father, the exact explanation of who all these people are is covered in these Sumerian documents, which are the oldest documents on your planet. And that's why in these, in these books, I have literally matched up from the Sumerian Kings list over here on the side of the page. I have matched up for you. Let me go over here to this side. I have matched up for you in the Sumerian texts, what name goes with what biblical name? This is the first time this has been done in history that I'm aware of. I have matched up the Sumerian names with the biblical names, and they're going to fit together like a glove because they're telling the same stories from opposing views. Man, the, the ancient world, there should be no confusion about the ancient history of our world following the release of these materials. These sections here deal with Gilgamesh and his journey to go see Noah. There's never been any confusion, even with the hardcore atheist secular communities, that that's what the Epic of Gilgamesh is discussing, or portions thereof. We're taking that a lot further. I'm breaking down for you. Gilgamesh is telling you exactly where he went to. He's telling you details about Noah. Prior to him, Gilgamesh is a friend of Nimrod's son, Pan, or who would earlier have been called Tammuz, seen here deified on a throne. Inanna, or who is often called Semiramses, she is, oh man, this is an arrogant little gal, of all of the granddaughters of Ham. And there's thousands and thousands and thousands of these basically at this point. Nimrod, who she's married to, this was also the great, 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 not great, great, great. This was the, this was the spoiled grandbaby. Spoiled way out there. Grandbaby. And when I say grandbaby, I'm talking his other brothers could have been 200 years old by the time that Nimrod was born. So to put this in perspective, he, and this is an effect that even happens today, where the, the, the young baby gets glorified over its brothers and sisters because it's the young baby one, born at the same time that they might even have their own grandchildren. That's who Nimrod was. You're gonna go on a journey from darkness, stepping out into the light. Trey Smith. And set my camera down a second. All of these puppies here, right here in front of you, are available over at GodInAShell.com. That's a trifecta if I ever saw one. Right. 
keep it yours, guys. We really don't know how old Nimrod was because neither the, the, the Sumerian texts are going to give us convoluted answers, and the book of Genesis follows the descent line that's leading to Jesus Christ. So though it talks about Nimrod, it doesn't focus on, on his age. What you look at on pages like this with the Genesis timelines, first of all, Noah was 600 years old when the flood came. He lived roughly 300, 350 years afterwards. He died not long after the fights with Nimrod. To put this in just a little better perspective, this right here is a map of the United States from the late 18, from the 1800s. Just a little before that, you're talking about sparse sprinkles of pilgrims and Indians. Fast forward just a couple hundred years. You are at bustling, towering cities from sea to shining sea and everywhere between lit up from space each city with millions and millions of residents in just a couple of hundred years and that's not even with families having 10 and 20 kids apiece as is what you're reading in those ancient records Nimrod could have been 200, he could have been 150, he could have been, many of these other kids had, had their children at the ages of 125, 135, was a common age. And if Nimrod is the beloved grandbaby, he, he may well be further out than that. What we know for a fact is that when you're dealing with ancient, when you're dealing with population growth, that happens far more rapidly than people imagine. Starting with those three people coming off the ship by the time of Nimrod, you could have had hundreds and hundreds of thousands, and did, mathematically you would have, that were living at that time. Those were the people building your cities. So the Epic of Gilgamesh, this is a museum quality replica that I'm holding in my hand here that we were lucky enough to get. By the time of the Epic of Gilgamesh, there would have been, there, there, there could have been by the time of Abraham, which is in that same time frame, your mathematics puts you at roughly 10 million people by that time on the planet Earth. And then uh, who was married to, oh my gosh, this is the ultra spoiled brat of the Ham family. I'm gonna talk about why Ham got the curse. And by the way, getting that we're all living under a curse in this place. That comes from the lineage of Adam. So you're not a vape, doesn't matter what race, creed, color, anything that you are, you're living under a curse. All of us need deliverance from the curse. But in the case of Ham, the reason Noah got so mad at Ham is because Ham, Ham was a thief, a lying, cheating thief. And that's why he told lies to his own family, which they couldn't have run from. Nimrod knew the stigma on his own family. And that's why he was trying, in these texts right here, some of the most arrogant on earth. And Nana is bragging about how they ripped off the garments, how, how Ham stole the garments, the garments of Adam and Eve that were given by God in the garden. In these texts right here, some of the oldest on the planet, she's bragging about that. She wore those garments at her wedding, according to these texts. They can't hide their shame of who they are. Or, hopping over to Egypt, the same trinity is called Osiris, that's Nimrod, Isis, that's Simramses, and Horus. Same three figures. So this set of three and three, three over here in Babylon and three over here in Egypt, they're not quite the same people, but they are the same religious system. Some interesting differences between the two, which we'll unpack in some later videos. But it is sufficient to state this. It is a complete set. I wouldn't make another six, wouldn't it? It's all ancestor worship. Coming right down through the line of Ham, through Kish, through Nimrod, or in Merker right over here, and the gods of Egypt, the plethora that are in fact written out right here by Manetho himself are all fallen angels, devils, and demons, beginning with Sanyaza and Azazel, according to the Book of Enoch, because Nimrod or Emmerker, coming through the lineage of Ham, has shifted everything. He was controlling the knowledge of mankind. Bottom line, he was worshiping devils. And that's the history that you're reading and these fallen angels and devils 
are in fact one and the same as the gods of Egypt. And Alexander the Great had declared himself as Pharaoh of Egypt. And he began funding the, to gain all of the knowledge of the world. And that would include the writing of the Septuagint for the Hebrews, which means 70, the most concise history on earth. But he also funded the Egyptians through Manetho to give you a history of the world. So your secular guys have gone with the pagan, the priest of Thoth, which is funny. It's interesting in and of itself. Thoth is the god of wisdom to the Egyptians to write your history of the world. And that history matches tit for tat with the biblical history. Oh, the only difference is this. In the Egyptians' view, all of the fallen angels, the demons, the devils, all of this stuff, all of your witchery is really good guys. In your Hebrew history, demons and things like this are bad guys. And I've got the book for it right here. Look at the back of those, aren't they hot? The Exodus will not only come out as a film this year, it's also one Nimrod. And by the way, this entire pre-flood has just gone up for free. We're going crazy sacrifice and skulls all the way. It's charts and graphs and timelines and images beyond imagination. Let's take a walk through here. All of the pages, all of the pages have high definition imagery. You're going to go through, in the Exodus one, you're going to go through, there's no Exodus like this. You're going to go through the Pharaohs, the Pharaoh of the Exodus, Joseph, the Hebrews, all of the evidence for all of these things is in this book. And Nimrod, this is Nimrod like told, it's never been told like this before. This is what the inside of that book looks like. So every page is HD, full high definition imagery. You're going to walk through the openings of our world. That's what you're going to do in these books. As you can imagine, we're going to be going, these are all skulls from early Mesoamerican, so we have the, the head binding done to the skulls. This one has got a complete spinal cord. We're going to be going strange skulls all the way in these documentaries. You're going to go through all of the ancient gods, all of the ancient gods and goddesses, the importance of those god and gods and goddesses, the ancient people, the, the origin. It's a tracking of darkness and light. It's what it is. This whole set is what that is. This is what the soft covers look like. And they're equally as beautiful. They're a touch less expensive. Either one looks absolutely stunning. You're inside cliff walls. You're in an ancient Indian dwelling. And the Exodus is going to come out. And so will Nimrod. And we're going to walk you through <laughs> the unimaginable of the ancient world. Just like you're watching inside of this video. Now you boys in universities, which you're actually fighting against, and everybody knows it with your monkey world stuff, is the Bible. We are about to take a prehistoric journey into the pre-flood world. It's called the Balancing Rock. There's only, and you've got a lot of those that are near mountain ranges, particularly this mountain range, the Rocky Mountains in Colorado, where rock See, you need calamity that is spewing earth to get a rock, a rock that is set and is balanced like that rock over there. Towards, now all of these that you're gonna see in these cases are clearly monkeys. And I wanna, I, I wanna, I just wanna isolate out for you, Lucy's skull. I want you to take a look at Lucy's skull right there. Now if, now they'll make Lucy, that's Lucy right there. Now, they'll make little Lucy look like she's humanish. Now, if you can't look at that and tell that that's a monkey skull, even as a layman on the other side of the screen, now, that'll pass nine junior doctors at National Geographic. They'll put modeling skin on that thing and make it look like a little person standing there. That all of your people, whether light or dark, from your ivory towers, believe different than the common man at the bottom. The common man who gets taught in the public schools. Well, that we come from missing links or, or monkeys. Now this comes from Charles Darwin. See, they pa see m part of my problem with this is that if you're, if you're paying big dollars or families are funding large dollars at universities, there's some people who put some cheap modeling clay on something like this. And these are people that claim they know anatomy. Claim they know anatomy. All of those names on there, this ought to be the evidence that these people ought to never work in anything like that again. 
And Darwin was a 22-year-old that lived 150 years ago. Yeah, that's an Ewok-looking thing. They claimed was what a Neanderthal looks like. Neanderthals we know today to be actual human skeletons, only like everything from the past. It's tougher, thicker, more durable. All the teeth fit, even the wisdom teeth perfectly. The brain size is much larger than ours today. Bone for bone, like a heavy duty, no nonsense built human being. This is a Neanderthal skeleton. This is a modern human skeleton. You can almost look at it, it's a de-evolution. This skeleton right here is bone for bone, tit for tat. It's a heavy duty human skeleton. So I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about the, the story of Noah from the book of Yasher in a way that you haven't probably heard it. As we, we walk through some of this evidence of the flood, view the modern human skeleton like a little bitty rinkety dink Little pickup truck, little bucket pickup truck. Yeah. The book of Yasher is a text, it's a collection of the Jewish texts that would have been carried with the Hebrews out of Egypt and then collaborated into one piece. The, the Hebrews bore none of any text on the planet, just like the letters are mesmerizing and contain almost magical properties. And look at the Neanderthal skeleton like a heavy-duty, duly, no-nonsense, fully decked out truck. There's going to be animals coming. Animals know where the storm is. And when you do the math on Noah's Ark, you're going to find that engineers today call the mathematics of that boat, the dimensions of that vessel, the most optimal for exactly the job that that boat would have to do. I had to learn myself what's the difference between a human skeleton skull, this would be a human skull, right here. So this one, right here on the screen, that's a human skull. What's the difference between that and a monkey skull? This right here, that right there on the screen, right there, that's a, that's a monkey. So how do we tell the difference? And that was the time frame during which that he built the boat. Now, after the flood, you see structures like the pyramids, all of the ancient temples, not just a few, all of the ancient structures of the ancient world mesmerize and amaze us. <laughs> yeah, that would come right through the bloodline of a family just like that. But on the day that the flood came, and by the way, it came seven days after Methuselah died. His name means his death shall bring, or his death shall bring the judgment. The truth is your ancient epics, like the Epic of Gilgamesh, or your ancient Sumerian documents, the, these documents are covering all sorts, they're definitely covering dragons from the ancient world, which they're describing in detail. But more than that, they're describing all sorts of unusual animals. Very similar animals to the things we find in the fossil record underneath the ground. That's why you have to learn on some things to look at them yourself. How do I tell the difference? Monkeys don't have a forehead. This thing right here, you see that? No forehead on the monkey. Monkeys don't have foreheads. Now I want you to notice something else about nothing. This little nose bone that can get broke if somebody punches you in the face, you're like, ah, right? Monkeys do not have a little nose bone. They don't. Which gets us to why a lot of your original, uh, your original Neanderthal skeletons. This is one of many, and this used to really bother me when I would look at some of these early Neanderthal skulls they would find. Eventually they found so many of them that they couldn't cut all the noses off because, it, you know, you've got honest people in there that are, you know, like, hey, we found it like this, it had the nose. But the early ones, well, they were really pushing this theory. Well, they would all be like that. You'll notice you can go through streams of images with them until they found so many that, you know, you just can't ignore the fact they've all got nose bones. They're taking that off because monkeys don't have nose bones to make it look more monkeyish. No monkey skeleton is like a human skeleton. It's just simply not. Homo Neanderthal skeletons, the early ones, you find example after example after example where they would cut this square spot here. That's because everybody knows well, everybody within an anatomy community knows that, well, that would prove it's a human. So you, there's always the missing parts. Even with Lucy, they would say, oh, no, it, it's the kneecap. It's the kneecap and the feet. If we just had the missing parts that we didn't find, then we could prove to you it was obviously those missing parts or the parts we would have needed to show you it was a monkey becoming a, a human. The reason for the flood is stated in the book of Genesis. That tells you about fallen angels and things like this in Genesis 6. 
But I would note that God only spends a second or two talking about any of that. It was because the wickedness of man was so great, the wickedness and violence of man was so great in the earth that it repented God at his heart that he had made man. Noah preached them for 120 years, for 120 years. Now, I'm going to play for you some clips of a tape as we go through the evidence sort of of the pre-flood and against evolution and these kind of things. During the time period that it was making splashes of news that they were finding soft tissue, then blood, then etc, etc, and dinosaur bones, specifically starting with a T-Rex. Well, you did some, it's really nice that Richard was, in, you know, involved in that kind of stuff. You did some of the, uh, you know, I, I had looked at your stuff and the presentations that you put together uh, arguing against those footprints being young, those were some of, I mean, those were bar none. Uh, the most stellar presentations on, on the topic that, that I can find. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. I put a lot of time and work into it. And like I said, I'm, I'm, I've been for many years uh, working on a full-length book on, on the subject. It's just going very slow. And These are footprints that were men and dinosaurs looking like they're running from something together and then layers of sediments had covered those tracks. Well, a lot of Christians had spent millions of dollars and doctors out there digging and excavating. And they were finding not only streams of tracks, but tracks of dinosaurs and humans that crisscrossed. Then the Dallas Crime Lab came out and verified that these were authentic tracks. Well, this really got the evolution community very concerned. In comes Richard Dawkins. I wanted to talk to you. Uh, yeah, go ahead. It's interesting. At that time, I, my own views were kind of still evolving, and even though I had, um, you know, kind of stirred, added the, the refutation of the human footprints there, um, I was uh, not that long out of college and still, you know, still refining my own views. And, you know, for a while I was kind of buying into some of the creation stuff, and then I uh, soon realized the earth was very old, and then also, uh, you know, before too long. Came to fully accept evolution and the rest of it. Yeah. When Richard came down, I remember I was still a little undecided about some things. So we had some spurred discussions about all that, and the, but we were in total agreement about the footprints because you know I had some kind of the gist uh, of my work was refuting what the footprints are actually. Refuting the dinosaur human footprints, like it was taken awfully seriously. He comes out to America does a documentary on the footprints and the guy he uses that had been writing up articles, science articles, against Christians. Then when he goes home, not long afterwards, and he even states in there, if even one of those tracks was real, it would be devastating to what we believe, i.e. evolution. Not long afterwards, those tracks were smashed. Well, pretty much everybody in the creation sectors they, they, I asked him, why don't you talk about the footprints anymore? Well, because the big comedy shows, the same ones that would have Richard on, right? They, they bad-mouthed it, too bad to, you know, we don't even talk about it anymore. Well, those tracks had also been smashed, and people like Richard would go out there and say, what idiot would believe a smashed footprint like that was actually a human dino footprint? So, the guy that Richard was working with here in the U.S., to badmouth Christians in science article after article after article revolving around those footprints. Well, it turned out he was doing painting. So I made a phone call to him. I always have time for, you know, interesting projects. So, you know, I'd be interested in hearing more about what you're up Well, and that's that's a good, I, I, I tell you what, it, it's just, it's, a, it's an honor uh, to be on a phone with a man that interacted with with Richard Dawkins and did the most thorough presentations arguing against the the footprints I um, uh, I've got some cash you laid on me how much it would cost what I'd like to do is I'd like to get a large painting with like a um, look like a big demon and um, so a big demon well it's got a big well hear me out you're gonna like the rest of the painting it's got a big okay so it, it would have a, it would have this is only one of the paintings but it's got a very large demon in the background and it's got the footprints underneath <laughs> Yeah, this would be, uh, but this is this is funny. I think you're gonna like it. The, you've got a demon in the background, and then you've got the uh, you've got the you've got the footprints, 
that are underneath so those those footprints there at Glenrose right there in front of the demon is you Glenn holding an iron pipe and bashing the footprints so that no one can see the human footprints with the dinosaur footprints. No, I, I, I'll pay you for the painting. I, they, will you do it? I, I'll pay you well. I'll get you. I'll, I'll, you tell me how much you need. So this would be a demon in the background, and you viciously coming at the footprints with an iron pipe and smashing them up and you can be frothing at the mouth or however you want to do it Glenn you can even put Richard popping out from the side of you if you want <laughs> do you want to do it? I'll, I'll pay you I'll pay you good for it <laughs> I feel like um, you know they posted on the comedy record you know who is this really um, really no 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 I'll pay uh, uh, listen I'll pay you I'll pay you very well for it Glenn, I've seen the before and after shots, man. I, I'm telling you, listen, Glenn, listen, Glenn. I've seen your drawings. You do good work. Look, you de you destroyed the footprints. I'm still, I'm still really confused what this, what this is all about. Well, no, no, this is what it's about, man. I told you at the opener of the call. I, I, I'm looking for some artwork done, and I could think of no better than nobody better than you to draw the image. You, you're doing artistry. I'll pay you for it. I'll get you the cash immediately. Draw a picture. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't really know this all about it. Anyway, you, uh, whoever this is, you know, the, the track, the track that, that uh, he was talking about is still there. Doesn't even look that different. To Glenn, that's a, that's a heck of a slip, my friend, that they don't look all that different. Yes, Glenn, they look very, very different. Here's the before and here's the after. That is an enormous Okay, so difference. rocks like this one here that are balanced upwards like this. There's no way to get this formation. And if I come inside here, you can see right through to the other side of it. And you can see all the people that are out here taking pictures. But this rock is balanced on top of me. You need a major cataclysmic catastrophe for rock formations like this. And you can even see the sediments of ocean and salt water all over these ancient stones. The word dinosaur, dinosauria, comes from Sir Richard Owen, means terrible lizard. And it was just a scientific term for what had previously been called dragon. Sir Richard Owen spent his entire life fighting the theories of Charles Darwin. Today, his word dinosaur is used for the evidence for Darwin's theory. It's a slap in the face. The great man of science. I, I, I'll tell you this, man. I love you. I love you dearly. Yeah, I know. I get that. I, you know, you know, Glenn. I get that so much. And uh, you know, those tracks look familiar too. That you were out there with that uh, with that pipe going to work on them. I'm telling you. I'm telling you, Glenn. I'll pay you. Look, man. Look, look, Glenn. Glenn, listen, you hung out with Richard Dawkins. You used to give the presentations on him. I'm asking you, I'm asking you sincerely. Give me a number, Glenn. Tell me how much it costs for you to draw yourself breaking the footprints, breaking the evidence. You, I think it would be funny for you to draw up a picture of yourself hitting the prints. Well, I'm gonna. I want to hang it on my wall. I want a picture. I, 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 I the, the story that is so. Clear. Noah preached them for 120 years. That's an important number. Just like you have 12 months in the year. Just like you had 12 disciples of Jesus. It's like you had 12 tribes of Israel. 12 sons of Jacob. 120. 12 is the number of authority before God. For 120 years, he preached them. Repent, repent. Now, the genetic instructions God gives in the book of Yasher, I find fascinating. But the animals had come and were showing up for literally months around that vessel, as far as the eye could see, with the tightest huddle around that boat where they were beginning to pack them on. And the lioness ran away and stood in place of the lions. And Noah saw this and he wondered greatly. And he rose and he took the two whelps. These are baby lions. He took baby lions. He was taking baby creatures. It tells you that right here in the text. And notice that he's been given instructions on which ones to pick and which ones not to pick. These are called living fossils. All of these things you see here, most of them plants and fish and crickets and cockroaches and things like this, or even birds, beavers, everything. Ancient world stuff is either giantly larger, and even if it is giantly larger than the stuff today, it's absolutely identical. 
So here's a cricket. You notice he looks identical today as he did in the ancient world, so he didn't evolve. Here you've got a spider. He looks ident identical today in the fossil record as he does in the ancient world. Over here you've got a plant. Most of your fossil record, most of your fossil record is plants, sea life, seashells. If you were to look at the strata underneath the ground, most of it is chock full. If you're honest about what's in there, it would be seashells and clams, seashells and clams, seashells and clams, all the way down to the bottom. We're in Colorado right now, so in fish, that's the mountains, okay? So a lot of fossils, this is about as far from an ocean as you're gonna get. So this that I'm looking at around and the bottom, this is a shark's mouth from the ancient world. This is called the Megalodon. You have sharks all over the place. You have fish in every desert. You have whales in deserts. So here's two fish crisscrossing each other. That's gonna be a little more expensive. If you have a fish swallowing a fish, right? It's hard to do that. I mean, they didn't lay there for millions of years doing that. Here, of course, is your classic fish eating a fish. That's a nice one right there. Here's another fish going, eating another fish. All these buried in stone. Here's another fish eating a fish. These guys are all over the place. Not good enough for you, fish eating other fish. Well, here's an ancient horse, unevolved by the way, surrounded and buried with fish all around it. Now with the horse, they used to say that an ancient version of the horse, that his neck just grew and grew, because he wanted to get to the trees that were up there high, because it's like the little train that thought it could, I guess. You just will it and it happens. Well, that can't happen because... So this is up above me, this is a giraffe's neck and anatomy. It spreads all the way up there to the top. And in that long neck, he's got valves. They go all the way down the neck in the blood vessels. This way when the head goes up and down, right, that the blood doesn't run back and forth so quick. This is a lot different than a horse. You've got, you've got valves that go all the way down the neck of this animal. That way when it puts its head down, it won't go unconscious when it lifts its head back up. A horse doesn't have that. And if it didn't, this, I mean, it can't go unconscious every time it goes down for a drink of water. More than that, up here inside of their head, inside the big head of the giraffe, he's got sponge-like material in there that keeps the blood inside the brain. And valves that go all the way down this long, this long pretty neck here. Look how tall he is. Look how tall he is here. So when he goes up and down, he won't go unconscious. So, and you couldn't have evolved that. You need that from the very start. You started with a bunch of stuff, now you've got less stuff. Where was the evolution at? The explosion of life that's happening on this picture, all we know for a fact is that that's not happening today. In fact, everything here declines over time. But you've got tons of stuff that's identical in the past as it is right now today, or it's mammothly larger, no pun intended, like the mammoth is a giant elephant. You had all the things you have now, only many of them were giantly more mammoth in scope. And you have more things then than you have now. So in the past, you had bigger, badder, stronger, tougher things, and more of them, and now you have less of the same things. So you know that in the ancient past, there was some difference between the world today, where things are weaker, smaller, and punier, and the ancient world, where things were bigger, badder, and tougher. Creatures from the ancient world that are Tyrannosaurus rex or larger in scope, the food sources, trees today that are little bitty, little bitty, little bitty trees with, with trunks the size of my finger, you couldn't get your arms around. The shots you're looking at of the mammoth on Branson, Missouri, the mammoth is a giant elephant. All of them are found buried in earth. The mammoths are found standing upright in ice on just the edges of the ice. If that's what you find on the edges, what do you think you find deep inside the ice? These creatures are found, turned this way, the dinosaurs, in death poses underneath the ground. Sludge, they were running from something and their heads are going up gasping for breath so much that the head breaks and they're trapped <laughs> gasping in these poses. That pose is so common right there that it has a name for it the death pose, where the dinosaur is gasping for air. Now, this dinosaur dragon that I'm holding, just like you'll see in the fossil record, and here's the gooey guts for him. All of the gooey guts for him, or for you and I, or for any animal on this planet, these creatures are found in the fossil record 
fully formed. There are no transitional forms leading to any of these megalithic, these giant, whether they're giant or not, animals from the ancient world. <laughs> Do you, all of your animals show up fully formed in the fossil record. There are no transitional creatures. Are there transitional creatures leading to you? No, he just wants food. I wish we had some food for him. But that animal right there, you can have a lot of types of deer in deer coating. But you don't have turtle shell coat in a deer. You don't have whale coat in a deer. Do you have any whale coat where your ancestors whales? No, I think he says no. He would just like some pine needles. Okay, guys, we're going to take off on you. You can't have something evolving its parts because it needs, just like all of your parts, if your heart were even slightly off, trust me, you would know about it. You need all of the parts working and functioning properly from the very start. Otherwise, the animal, just like I've got its guts out here, it couldn't live without its guts in there, fully formed, fully functional, and ready to go from the very start. If they've got 30 foot long necks, but you can do the math for the muscles in the neck leading to that giant head. Now, I'm not telling you that the animal couldn't lift it with those muscles, but what I'm telling you is that today he would have enormous trouble doing that. This animal would be at great lengths just to lift its head up, many of them. Look at the size of the bones of this creature. So there is some difference between the world of the past. You need a Garden of Eden style world to facilitate these Garden of Eden style animals like you see the bones for in every museum as we walk along here what i have here on the screen that's sir richard owen and he's standing next to a an ancient moa which is a giant ancient ostrich that is an ostrich from today that behind it is an ostrich an ancient moa an ostrich from the ancient world it's about twice as large this right here that is an ancient pre-flood beaver little bitty beaver that right there is the modern beaver. It actually is little bitty compared to its ancestor. This right here is an ancient bumblebee from the, the ancient world, pre-flood world, next to a hummingbird. They're about the same size. This right here is an ancient rhinoceros. I always love getting to do these, the, the ancient giant animals. What you see here is a bed of bones of, in this case, just a chunk of rock taken out. I said here is an exhibit of, in this case, rhino bones, all buried. So animals tend to herd. This creature above me is a giant ground sloth. Most of those dinosaurs, particularly the giant ones that would fill buildings that are larger than the one that I'm in, a lot of the stuff they have out there in China, it could, the thing couldn't even breathe today. It could not, the animal could not breathe today. And you find these animals, particularly if they're mammals, because mammals all herd, you find them in graveyards. Your giant ancient sea turtle on the screen right there. This right down here, this little bitty guy, that's a modern bald eagle's head. That right beside it is an ancient bald eagle's head. And that right there, that's an armadillo from the ancient world. Almost the size of a modern day VW bug car. This is a modern orangutan. And that behind it is an ancient orangutan. This is our modern camel right there. This is an ancient camel on the screen right there. This you see right here is a modern cow's head. And this you see right here, underneath which stands Louis Leakey, one of the promoters of the claim Missing Link Lucy staring at this giant goatish cow head right there. The geological column seen right here on the screen, drawn for us by Charles Lyell. This is Charles Lyell on the screen up here. He was an attorney friend of Charles Darwin. He wrote this, Charles's theories delighted me. If pushed as far as they must go, it would prove that men may have come from the orangutan. Charles Lyell. Now the reason they don't use the orangutan anymore is because, well, we found ancient orangutans. They looked identical to today, only just like right here, there's your modern orangutan. The ancient one was 30 feet tall. Who openly told us that he hated God, that he hated Christians. 
he wasn't a geologist, he was an attorney. But we still use his charts today for what we call the geological column. Layers of strata, what they are, layers of strata underneath the ground, all the way down to the Precambrian layer. We get giant earthworms, coincidentally. Layers is, there's, layers are not made, strata underneath the ground is not made of moon dust. It's full of billions of things, dead things, all fossilized in there, mainly sea life all the way to the bottom. You, you got six foot tall penguins in deserts. They don't tell you that in your history class. Go look it up. That's where you excavate penguins is in the hottest, the most arid deserts on earth, like the Atacama. It's full of penguins, man. Six foot tall penguins. And when you look at the Precambrian layer, that's the bottom layer in all of it, they're gonna say, oh, look at us, we found giant earthworms. Yeah, that's your original earth layer. And big surprise, they're giant earthworms. Everything from the ancient world, human skeletons, the deer skeletons, everything from the birds, the bears, to the beavers, to the elephants being mammoths, and the little bitty lizards being dinosaurs. It's all mammoth in scope. Ancient chimpanzee, modern chimpanzee. Okay, so let's talk carbon dating for a minute. Because if you've got in the ancient past a Garden of Eden style world is going to require an entirely different or wildly different atmosphere above us which is going to pump out numbers that are crazy just like the crazy animals you find under the ground crazy answers on any of your dating tests. This is Willard Libby. Not only was he involved in the Manhattan Project, but he was also a developer of radiocarbon dating. A dirty little secret about radiocarbon dating is that Willard discovered is that, well, your atmosphere has to equalize. That hasn't happened. The mathematics on how long it would take for our atmosphere to equalize is 30,000 years. It hasn't equalized yet i.e. what Libby discovered is that our atmosphere, according to radiocarbon dating, is under 30,000 years old. Do what you like with that math, I'm just telling you what he discovered. These are all on the screen, carbon dating results from dinosaurs. You probably didn't even know these existed, and that's because Western universities censored these results and fought vigorously for there to be no carbon dating done on dinosaurs. Now, in China and Hong Kong, places like that, they just wanted honest answers. Hey, what are the dinos test at? All of these dinosaurs here, save not one of them, tested because they're not, it's not just rock, it's actual bone that you've got. That's why you've got soft tissue all over inside of it. That's why you can carbon date it. All of these dinosaurs tested between 20,000 and 40,000 years old the same age as your frozen mammoths and your other claimed Ice Age animals. The reason for that is not just that they lived at the same time, thus the reason that they carbon date the same, but because the atmosphere allowing for the massive Garden of Eden vegetation you find under the ground was an entirely different atmosphere. This right here, this little bitty guy, that's a modern horsetail plant trunk. This right here, going from side to side, that's the trunk right there of an ancient horsetail plant on the screen behind me. Bottom line, if you're testing for carbons, like in a radiocarbon test, and the carbon levels are wildly different in the past than they are today, then it's going to shoot out crazy results all over the place, which indeed it does. Okay, this right here is a modern dragonfly. Right up above it is an ancient dragonfly. Some of these had three feet wingspans. This animal right up here couldn't even lift off the ground and fly or breathe today. Now, here's another fun fact about radiocarbon dating. The, not only do you find it in dinosaurs, you find it in oil. Oil is caused, you can form oil in under five minutes in a lab. Oil requires biological material, heat, and pressure, intense pressure. The same thing with coal, the same thing with diamonds. Okay, this guy here, his name is Fred. How you doing, Fred? This is a Sinclair dinosaur right next to the Dino Mart. The reason these dinosaurs are the logo for the, for the Sinclair is because they used to say that dead dinosaurs is how oil was formed because it's massive pockets of biological material that are underneath the ground. They've got another one over here. All four of those things mentioned have been found with C14 in them which is what radiocarbon tests test for. If the whole world 
were one big ball of carbon-14, it would have been all decayed. That's what you're measuring on the test, is the decay rate. How much has decayed? And you're starting with the assumption of how much there was at the beginning. So if you had a Garden of Eden-style ancient world to facilitate most every creature that existed, this right here is a modern dragonfly, a little bitty tiny little guy right there at the beginning and now something changed dramatically in moments or very rapidly. Right up above him is an ancient dragonfly. Then that would throw out big results on your carbon tests. Anyhow, if the whole world was one big ball of carbon-14, it would all be gone in one million years. Yet, you find it in dinosaur bones, all oil deposits, all coal deposits, and all diamonds have C14 in them, i.e. they can't be old. Man, you're looking at a tire, not just of the animals giant in the past, not just of the human skeletons, the Neanderthals. Man, these are heavy duty human skeletons. The lizards are big, the elephants are mammoths, the tigers are cyber saber twos. You got whales in every desert. You need, you need a catastrophe of Earth coming so quick that it compresses entire ecological systems, entire ancient jungles, and all of their wildlife crushed underneath the ground to produce the oil and gasoline for the cars on that street over there. Anyhow, he's a good dinosaur. Love the Sinclair dinosaur. I'm a big dinosaur fan. Coincidentally, this geological column is sorted by weights and densities. And by the way, the dinosaurs you find in there, just like Belinda Lacoste Ranch, where you find dinosaurs mixed in in every level of this stuff. Her property adjoins Dinosaur National Monument in Colorado. Well, this geological column, sorted by weights and densities, and inside rock layers like this, are littered with are littered with ancient squids on the Grand Canyon alone. It's just one of the layers. Now it's not just trees that you find standing upright and the layers are going through them, which means that you've got thousands of these, that the tree would have to be standing up for millions of years while the layers of dirt built up around it. But you've got, this is a nautiloid, that's an ancient squid. That nautiloid right there is standing upright. These are all fish fossils. These are all fish fossils. And these are probably 20 bucks. And there's so many. Look how many of them that there are. Look how many of them there are. Just little fish fossils. They're so they're so common. And again, we're in the mountains right now. And they're just all over the place. One after the other after the other. A good looking one costs more. Or a fish eating another fish would cost a little more. Take a look at all these. Take a little look at them. And they're so common, they're so frequent, that they cost little more than the cost of a McDonald's hamburger. And what's actually called Nautiloid Canyon, because there's so many of them that came tumbling through that canyon with a sludge of mud and dirt that placed them there. And they're tumbling in all sorts of degrees because they were tumbling through there with water rushing them in that laid down those layers. But about an eighth of them are standing upright. So this means those poor squid, according to your modern theories of evolution, would have had to have been standing on their head for millions of years while the layer built up around them. Your entire Earth, it, in fact, there is the evidence for the global flood is the entire surface of the Earth. The geological column, sorted by weights and densities, just like dirt does in a process called liquefaction, like what I've got in this motion art right here, well, gee, George, it's not going to rain down limestone for a million years and then decide, okay, now I'm going to do sandstone. The layers, are, there's, a, there's a scientific name for how layers like this are formed. It's called liquefaction. How this sands in motion water device is beginning to build layers and strata just like the geological column behind me right here inside this little water device. If underneath the ground you've got mammoths that are buried, like out in Waco, Texas, you've got a mother mammoth that's lifting up her baby on a tusk, found buried standing up. In Mongolia, you have dinosaurs in mid-battle with each other. You literally, in Mongolia, have dinosaurs in mid-battle with each other. They didn't even have time to look the other way. 
and whatever covered them, dirt covered them, dirt and sludge covered them so fast while they're in mid-battle that they don't even have time to look at whatever it was that came and covered them and left them in positions like that underneath the earth. This is more than a trilobite found at the bottom or a Precambrian earthworm. These are dinosaurs that didn't have time to stop fighting and look the other way that are covered as fossils in earth. Now, if you go all the way to the outskirts, just the edges of the ice in places like Russia is where you started finding your frozen mammoths. This right here that we're looking at, this is a baby frozen mammoth. Its name is, they call it Dima. And this is one of many frozen mammoths that have been found in Siberia, in Russia, in edges of the ice. So when the water, when water squirts up, when the underneath, if you have big pockets of water underneath the ground, and you get one hairline fracture that runs the surface, it will follow the path of least resistance all around the globe and spew that water up. And it will, if you were close to where that water's coming out, it would vaporize you in seconds. If you were on the poles, that water would go up so high that it would come into space that it would come down as freezing ice, raining on top of these creatures and burying them in seconds in ice and sludge. Frozen so quickly that they're standing up and you're finding that the little bones in their bodies, the one, the first one they found, he's taking a step and every bone in his leg is broke from whatever and bones all through his back are raining down on him. And the food in his mouth that he's not done chewing is all tropical food. This wasn't an ice age he was in. He was eating tropical food. Now I want you to take a good look at these layers of strata that have formed identical to what you see but on a very much smaller scale. Take a look at the strata that's formed right there. You see little layers of strata that have formed? And, th and this is a cheap one, not even a nice one, with very many weights and densities of sands in it. And you can see the strata forming in minutes on this little tiny water with sand art device. More than this, Java Man, this was another buddy of Charles Lyle, who drew those stratification charts that are used in your kids' textbooks today, just like another buddy of his drew the fake embryo charts. Java Man, we know today, not only was the guy that put forth Java Man, this was a friend of Charles Lyle, who gave us the charts of the strata that we still use today. Well, his buddy was the one that gave us this wonderful piece of art, following Piltdown Man, the famous fraud. We know today he was mixing bones in his basement, is what he was busted at, which is why people backed away from him, even back then, that wanted to support him. Java Man, ancient chimpanzee, modern chimpanzee. Java Man was a giant ancient chimpanzee. Big surprise. The first claim missing link came from a man named Charles Dawson. A lot of Charleses surrounding this whole evolution thing. This hoax went on for 40 years. They told people, they said, well, if Christ, they kept it in the lockbox. They said, well, if Christians were allowed to examine it, they would, they would destroy it because here we have the evidence of a missing link. Well, even the science community later because no other ones have been found. Well, let us take a look at what's in this locked box. Lo and behold, big surprise, it turned out to be a fraud. There's a monkey jawbone put on a human skull. You fast forward all the way to today and beyond Lucy because they're still looking for these missing links. We can't find one. Well, Lee Berger over here, he's from Johannesburg, Af South Africa, as I understand it. This is also, as I understand it, the third time he's done this and sold one of these to National Geographic. That's just my opinion. It's what I appear to be reading in the text. Well, here's the new Homo Naledi that they pumped everywhere, particularly in Europe. People were sick of walking, watching a documentary on it because it's all that played on television. You're a monkey, you're a monkey, you're a monkey. Okay, I'd like you to take a look at it up here. Here's the skull for what they found. We did one of the best write-ups on this. Well, I did comparisons to other monkeys right there in the same area where they found the skeleton. And, well, that's a macaca monkey and it's identical to Lee's missing link up there. Now, I'd like you to notice another thing. You see how this missing link has no forehead? on the head. Now look at the recreation of it. Look at the size and scope of the giant Planet of the Apes forehead that they put on this thing to make it look like a person, like a monkey becoming a person. 
Giant forehead, now look at the skull. Well, there it is, right there. No forehead whatsoever. Identical, coincidentally, to a macaca monkey. All right, so the scope of giant dinosaurs. One of the questions nobody asks, because everything in the past, all the fossils, these giant dinosaurs. Well, in evolution, you've got little things that are supposed to lead to bigger things. <laughs> so where are the little things that lead to something like a dinosaur? There are none. And where people ask, okay, so the missing link between monkeys and man, well, that question only gets worse when you ask what led to the monkeys. Modern living sea creature, little triops, modern basically trilobite family guys, ancient. These guys here that I'm looking at, these are trilobite guys. These guys here, the reason they're at the bottom is because they're little cleanup crews on the bottom of the ocean, just like you got lots of stuff that does that right now today on the bottom of the ocean floor. In fact, it comes from the very families of these trilobite guys. This right here is a modern rodent, actually a rat. There beside it is an ancient rat. Well, this right here is what they call an ancient winged terror. This is a bird, by the way, a pterodactyl-like bird. This thing here is about the size of a full-size, it is the size, full-size giraffe. So when you're looking at Nimrod, whether a book or movie version of it, that are meant to go together with the Exodus, and you're reading about Lugal Banda and the Anzu bird, this is part of the epics from ancient Samaria. Actual documents coming right after the flood while he's building his tower. That's what those documents are literally covering. The oldest documents on your planet. Well, in those documents when Lugal Banda, who in the biblical text is Shard Lamer of Elam, when he's telling you that he had this egg of an Anzu bird, Lugal Banda and the Anzu bird, and he was doing occult things to talk back and forth to the bird. Anyhow, he raised the bird and it would swoop over armies, perhaps swoop in and kill men for him. But definitely, he records often, it was his guidance from the air, his dark bird guidance, lord of the air. Well, when you're looking at the Argentavis Magnificence, well, Lugalbanda's story about his giant Anzu bird, a giant crow, a giant black crow, it starts to bring the story into a little more full focus, doesn't it? Noah had been preaching to those people for a hundred and twenty years. Twelve. Hundred and twenty years. And on the day that the foot, when Methuselah died, and he knew, we're, we're almost there. And they're getting ready and they're getting on board. On the day that the doors closed, and it says God closed the doors of that boat, was Dr. Jack Cuazzo, I used to speak to him on the phone here and there, but he actually passed away a few years ago, did Bonan, some of the world's, did more research than anyone on the planet. They still use his stuff today in the science journals on Neanderthal juveniles. And here's what he found, is that a person that was the age of 40 years old, 40, would appear like they were in their early or hadn't even reached their 20s yet. The boat was finished and Noah inside of that inside of that boat looking outside of that window that's described in Genesis the top of the boat and the hordes of mankind as the rain the water begin to come down the earth had already tremored and there's water coming in and it's coming in quick it's about to be spiraling upwards in his book buried alive he wrote that many of these not all some come after the flood but many of these Neanderthal skeletons, heavy-duty human skeletons, were massively drowned to death. It began to rain. It began to come down. And as it came down hard, those that had heard of Noah, the very ones that had called him a fool, called him an idiot, laughed and mocked at that Noah was the first conspiracy theorist. It's going to rain and drown you. Well, on that day, they came as a horde, an angry horde, as the waters were pouring down. This is according to Yasher. One that better displays that I've seen it in a museum of how they think the, the, the continents were formed. First of all, it can't work this way because you have, for example, 
um, what they're stating here is that the continent shifted apart. You can't do that because of the fact there's dirt underneath there. So where it goes down into your beaches and then it drops underneath and comes back up on the other side, that there's dirt under there so the, the continents can't slide together or slide apart. This right here that I'm showing you on the screen, this is called the Mid-Oceanic Ridge. The reason those areas where the crack is, and notice it's in the center of the oceans, that's because when the water came out and split forth and sunk down and formed your oceans, they go up and then the cliff sides are on the side and then there's your beaches, pushing these continents <clears throat> upwards. These are rocks that spit straight up and notice how they're right on the edge of the Rocky Mountains. Your mountain ranges are either little bitty on the edges of the coast or they're big in the center of the continents. And that's because when the flood occurred, when the water was spewing out from both sides, it compressed the continents in and the mountains rose in the middle. And there's water coming in and it's coming in quick. It's about to be spiraling upwards. And they came and they could feel the rain coming down and they're laughing. They screamed to him from the top of the window. They said, Open, open the door. We're going to die down here. Open the door. And Noah looked down from that window and he screamed to them, Where were your fears 120 years ago when I told you that this day would come? In fact, that probably constitutes most of them. Most of your fossil record is sea life, seashells, and clams from bottom to top. The rarest things are mammals. The very rarest things would be, a, you know, a cool-looking dinosaur. Most of it is sea life, planktons, clams, seashells, sea stuff. Like a big marine catastrophe happened, and all those layers that's in our globe, they go clear around the earth, so none of it's localized. More than that, Yasher is giving you an exact set of descriptions of how Noah is going to pick the little animals that are going to go in that door. Narrow is the gate. That boat would equal 750 full-size rail cars today, or a full-size super tanker. In other words, it would hold, well, the amount of animals that you would need to go on that boat if they were the size of full-size sheep. Roughly 75,000 animals. Remember, you only need the land mammals on this boat. You don't need the amphibians. You don't need the viruses. You don't need the bacteria. You don't need the plants. You don't need the insects. You don't need the, the insects are going to float on all sorts of stuff, and you definitely don't need the fish. So some of these animals, and they portray them in movies as they're, they're coming after to swallow the carnivorous creatures coming to, which makes great filmmaking. But the little bitty arms on that guy, he can't catch anybody. He's certainly not going to catch a deer. <laughs> not very many of them. And he's got to eat enormous amounts. Bears have claws. Yeah, it's true. Sometimes they're out there fishing. Yes, it's true. They can be carnivorous, but they like plants. And just because something has the equipment to kill doesn't mean that it has to. As food sources go away and your new world, the plants are smaller. I'd like to credit Dr. Walter Veith, who gave all sorts of the studies done with the diets of animals. This was a hardcore atheist professor who came to believe that the world was created by God. And he did that, in part he did that in studies dealing with animals, dealing with the animals' diets and finding that actually giving carnivorous animals vegetable diets actually improved the health of the animals. So creatures can chew, they can either chew a vegetable or they can chew other critters. And when things get desperate, they begin going to desperate measures. So in the ancient world, if you've got a guy like this, that's why you're hearing them be called dragons. When it comes running out of the brush at a village, you're looking at a desperate animal. And something today that may eat only on dead things or may eat their eyeballs out. Well, in the ancient world, if its food sources are giant vegetables, giant plants and fruits that it feeds on, and that goes away, or even portions of the year it goes away, out of desperation for survival, that puppy has got to chew on whatever it can get its mouth on.
This bird that I've got on the screen, isn't that bird beautiful? That's a Kia parrot from New Zealand. Isn't he absolutely breathtaking and gorgeous? Well, there he is pecking deep inside of the skin of something that he's just killed, swooped down and killed with his friends. Here he is pulling the innards out of a living sheep as they swoop down and begin to peck. Look at the size of the beak on that thing. He can chomp in, he can even kill a person. They would come in as flocks and farmers in New Zealand were angry at these things were killing their flocks of sheep. Was it these birds that had come to be known as the vampire parrots at that point? Well, their food source, the food source they had, the vegetables and the fruits that they enjoyed to eat had been taken away from them, had been mulled out of the way. So these were not vampire birds. What they were was desperate birds that were now going to any length to survive which is what happens as food sources begin to go away. When they begin to replant the food source, the vegetable food sources for these birds, they immediately left the sheep alone. As an animal becomes a scavenger, attacking type animal, it starts to look like a scavenger type animal. In fact, I'm suggesting to you that you even have remnants of plants today that are giant in scope that are leaveovers from that ancient world. Following the flood, you still had even some of the vegetation was enormous in scope following the flood. This one here, this guy's called the Nano Tyrannus. He's like a smaller version of a Tyrannosaurus rex is really what he is. And in fact, Mark Armitage was founding soft tissue inside. He found it in tons of dinosaurs. We certainly found it in these. And we have no idea what kind of fruits and enormous vegetables and what kind of proteins or other nutrients were power packed inside those things before the flood. What we know from the biblical text is that most of the, all of the animals had different food sources. They were living from the vegetation and the trees. They could get, a meat eater could get from a plant what he needs today to get by killing another animal. A lot of the stuff before the flood is enormous in size. The stuff after the flood, much of it is little tiny. And by the way, the creatures before the flood, even things that have big sharp teeth in their mouth, just because something has big teeth in its mouth, it can chew a vegetable with that, or it can chew another critter with that. As you lose things over time, things begin to fight at each other for survival. If we go with more realistic numbers, you're only using 12% of that boat's capacity. So in layman's terms, you could have played soccer inside that ship with all those animals on there. You've got genes within you and your digital programming code. And different combinations of those, like a Rubik's Cube, produce different effects, like white skin, the color of your eyes, the color of your hair with dogs. Is it a bald dog, a fluffy dog, a spotted dog, a furry dog, a tall dog, a small dog, a hairy dog, a bald dog? But you, don't, you can't get turtle coat out of them. And dogs don't have whale coat. And you don't have rhinoceros coat. That Rubik's Cube has only got so many squares with so many colors. Now, there's a bunch. 99%. Everything that's ever lived is gone today. So you started with a bunch of stuff, now you've got less stuff. And all of the animals were around the boat. It says that it was, there were animals as far as the eye could see into the distance surrounding that boat. Noah was given special directions, according to Yasher, of what animals to take and what animals not to take. Which ones to choose of the pairs of two. They came as a horde, an angry horde, as the waters were pouring down. This is according to Yasher. And they're surrounding the boat. And their leadership is looking up. And they look straight up at that window described in the book of Genesis. And they're yelling to Noah, Let us on board! Open these doors! They're screaming up there at him. And Noah appears at that window described in Genesis. And he yells back to them, as you, you, you called me fools. You called me fools. <laughs> the sixes came up. Now you stand here and you say you want on this boat. And not only does your mathematics, when you rewind time backwards, which I've done in videos such as Noah, your population growth, taking into account with the slow conquering of the entire globe, 
the increase in food production abilities, etc., etc., is going to rewind you back in time, actually to about 2400 BC. But the oldest vineyards, wine vineyards on earth, are also as well as your oldest written documents. Both trace backwards, specifically and precisely, to that spot in time and coincidentally that spot right there where the boat that saved all mankind is said to have landed on the planet. And they screamed back, they said, you open those doors, we're gonna die out here. And then they ran inward. The hordes that had come, that had surrounded the boat, they ran inwards. You look scared now. Where were your fears 120 years ago when I told you that this day would come? And they said, let us in, let us in, let us in now. Where were your fears at that hour? And they said, we're storming that boat. And it says, that they came in as a mad frenzied horde and the waters poured down even more intense. Okay, there's absolutely no way on the planet Earth, there's no way on the planet Earth to get rocks to balance like that. I want you to notice how small that is. I'm gonna come around the side of it. Come here. And inward. The hordes that had come, that had surrounded the boat, they ran inwards. And it was at that moment. You open those doors. And Noah replied, he said, that they ran inwards, that the waters came down hard, and the animals kicked outwards. No, you're not getting on this boat. And at that moment, the water began to rise like this. As the waters came in, the animals kicked outwards, and madness went every direction, and the chaos ensued. That's where the water broke free from, from those massive cracks. There's still water that we have no idea where it's coming from. Volcanic water coming from those cracks right now today. When the mountain ranges are formed, they're coming up, and you've got calamity throwing rocks and stones everywhere. The earth split open. The earth split open. You had enormous pockets of water underneath the ground in the ancient world. More than that, the spot that the boat took off from is right up here. You're as far from the edges of any of those cracks. If you were by the crack, it would vaporize you. And the animals kicked outwards and pushed the hordes back. Boom, boom, boom. And it was at that very moment that the waters rushed inward. If you're on the poles, up here or down here, the water is gonna go up so high, it's gonna come back down as, guess what? ice and the boat began to spiral upwards in seconds bury those creatures and Noah gripping on with his family inside it says in that moment in the text that every creature on board as the boat spiraled upwards screamed out in its own tongue it can't go up immediately and spiral the boat upwards, but it can go up fast, which is exactly what would have occurred at the very spot on the globe, on the globe, where Noah's Ark took off from. But if you were right here, the furthest from it, that water's gonna rain down fast and fast, and then suddenly it's gonna break and go upward, and your boat is gonna rest atop the waters. And Noah, gripping on with his family, Prayed under his breath, he spoke, Lord, please remember us. Please remember me, your servant. And it states at that moment in the text that it was then that the boat rested peacefully atop the waters. Thank you for watching Pre-Flood by the God in a Nutshell Project. I, this is the year, the year this is being released, the year 2020. That's the year that the vision becomes clear. It's a Joseph period, Joseph time period. I wanna thank all of you for watching. Here's what a complete set. Well, this is actually two sets is what this is. But there's the soft covers. And here I'm losing them on the end. There's the soft covers. And there's what the hard covers look like. That's the hardcover of pre-flood right there. 
and this is what it looks like on the inside so it's all HD high definition images on every single page so right down over here this is what the Exodus looks like this is the soft cover version of the Exodus and these are just absolutely gorgeous I can't, I can't get over how well these these things look you're gonna go through the true the true Osiris it's covered who he is in the ancient world and this is the hardcover and soft cover of the Exodus. This is the hardcover and soft cover of Nimrod. And finally, just like you're seeing the layers of strata from the ancient world in the past behind me, this is pre flood by God in a nutshell. Speaking of Berkeley, while we're picking on them for a moment. I, oftentimes, there are top-level PhDs that sometimes don't know these basic things. This comes out of Berkeley, and I find this fascinating because I come from a math background. My dad taught advanced mathematics for a university professor for, for years, teaching advanced mathematics. I'm uh, part-time. He did this while he worked at Shell. So I grew up with this. And Rice University had actually done math tests to see if evolution could even work. There, there's not even, there's no mathematical possible. You need things to improve over time. All in the, Obviously, there's not going to be math for that. It's not going to be supported by the universal language of mathematics in any way. This painting behind me was done by Salvador Dali. What you've got on this painting is it's Jesus Christ, and he is on top of, on top of, a tesseract. What a tesseract is, it's a four-dimensional object. Four-dimensional object, a higher dimensional object in a lower dimension or three-dimensional reality. It's unfolded into that reality. So you're only seeing the edges of the actual object, the larger object, just its edges unfolded in. God seems to love geometry and numbers and mathematics. In fact, he's got an entire book titled Numbers. Now, coincidentally, this object, the Tesseract, makes the shape of the cross. After the Hebrews had their exodus from the land of the pyramids, the land of the pyramids, in the book of Numbers, well, when they're moving loose, at, when they're moving loose in the wilderness, and God can come off like he's sort of, you know, he's sort of a very particular guy. He doesn't do a lot of explaining either. This object, the Tesseract, makes the shape of the cross in our three-dimensional reality, upon which Salvador Dali drew the Savior on top of that dimensional tesseract. Well, in the case of the Hebrews wandering in the wilderness, God said you can't camp northeast or northwest. You can only camp this wide, this wide, and up north. And then he wanted the tribes numbered so you'd have a count. Well, if you go through and you do the numbers, the math, and use the exact instructions that God gave to the Hebrews for their camp. With the Levites in the middle, the heart of that camp, it makes the shape of a giant cross wandering on the desert floor. It's often important to listen more because it will turn out that those pages, those scriptures, those numbers all have a meaning. The three nails that were in Jesus' hands and feet, it wasn't the nails that held him to that cross. It was his love for you and me. Now, speaking of dimensions, right here on this page, I have two little characters. I have Tom and I have Sally. Now, Tom and Sally are living in a two-dimensional world. We live in a three-dimensional world. Tom and Sally are on a sheet of paper. They live in a two-dimensional world. So Tom and Sally in their world, they're very hindered. See, I can get up face to face with Tom or Sally, and they don't even know that I'm there in their two-dimensional world. I could pass a ball through their world, and all they would see is a circle open and close. In fact, when Tom looks over at Sally, when he looks over at Saul, Sally, all he sees is a straight line. Tom can't even see Sally as she is. But from my three-dimensional perspective, I can see the fullness of Tom and Sally. 
And talking about dimensions, that brings us immediately to time. And I've often said, if it's a problem that Stephen Hawking couldn't solve, it must be a problem so simple even a child could understand it. Time has been a puzzle since the beginning. Let's see if we can solve a brief history of time in under about 60 seconds. Now let me ask you this. If in a higher dimension you can see a greater picture more, what do you think God sees when he looks at us? Your reality, your three-dimensional reality, at its very base, is made of quantum particles. Reality is made of things that cannot be regarded as real. That comes from the Jewish physicist Niels Bohr. Those particles are the quantum particles. Why the quantum particles break all of the rules, all the laws of physics, and drive the guys in the science videos crazy? Because they're breaking all the standard laws. Because those particles, you're looking at the moment that reality becomes when you zone into those particles. It's interactive. So those particles are making up a non-random reality. If reality did not have a source, if something were not making those particles, it would be totally random, like fuzz on your screen. But yet it's not. It's precise every minute. And just as Max Planck gave us measurements for, it's moving as a continuum, a live stream. And just as we find in our measurement problems, it behaves both as packets and as waves, simultaneously, both at once. And little particles at the base of it are going bloop, 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 and appearing so fast that it makes that continuum. So, I guess the question would really be, where are those particles coming from? Where is that live stream flowing through? What's producing this image we call reality? Now, seeing as that's the case, or appears to be the case, should we be terribly surprised in those ancient pages? Because this planet comes with a book. Should we be terribly surprised in those pages we're being told that reality has a trash folder? And that the stuff in that trash folder doesn't get deleted. And that's a bad thing. A trash folder for the stuff that bites the hand that feeds. Now, I want to take this a step further and come out of the fourth dimension into the third dimension. If I take a cube, a three-dimensional cube, just a box, a perfectly square box, like you might get at a store, and I were to open that box up and make it a two-dimensional geometric object, well, it becomes a cross. And by the way, portions of that mathematics worked on by Stephen Hawking himself surrounding black holes and large objects. You know, something called time dilation. I don't know whether a black hole is real or not, but that's really a mute to the argument. I'm talking about the math of it for just a second. If you have a large object in space, then time mathematically would slow down. You have whole movies about this event horizon and such, and you're going in and the time has stopped. You go up and you come back and the brother is younger. All sorts of neat little equations for this. Time behaves in funny ways. Well, if you've got a condensation of mass, that's your particles that are making up your black hole or your large planet or whatever it is that's slowing the time down, well, that's the same thing that occurs on your computer screen when you are producing a large object on your screen. It's got to render all of those pixel particles. And around that rendering, the time, the subset, just like you're in a subset of reality, the subset of time has slowed down around that object. Not only this, but if I take a look at this cross made out of a cube, a tesseract can also be a cube made into a cross. Well, if I count the squares on this two-dimensional cube made from a three-dimensional object, they are one, two, three, four, five, six. More than this, for there to be an image on the screen, an image in reality, a three-dimensional reality, that means that something has to be providing all of those pixels. And the reason they're breaking all of the rules is because they're coming from the place that makes the rules. When you hear the science guy say that there is no way on God's green earth that this place could have been created in six days on the seventh God rested. <laughs> well, brothers, have you not read Max Planck's work? This man here gave you the measurements for time. And once you're doing your measurement, they're now behaving according to all your standard laws of physics because no matter how quickly you do your measurement of those particles, it's already become a part of the past by sheer virtue of doing the measurement. It's become a part of the past. It's no longer movable or changeable or fixable.
When you're looking at the particles, the quantum particles, you're looking at the future, the place where reality becomes. You're looking at that very second. If I'm reading Max properly, not only was this created in six days, but every second, according to your own measurements, this place is being recreated and maintained as those pixels that are flowing through, it's being recreated millions of times a second. And that's why they're appearing like this. When you're looking at your computer screen, which is a collection of pixels, and mind you, when you're looking at a person on that screen, you're not looking at the person, you're looking at an illusion of that person. So what am I looking at when I'm looking at you? And you're consciously plugged in and running loose in a body in this little place. This place, reality, the bet, our home has a source. And I didn't pick for that bet to be there when I said that. What is consciousness? Where is that at? How much does that weigh? When you take the information on a hard drive, does it weigh more when you fill up the thumb drive than it does when it's empty? What is a thought, an idea, that live stream? Where does it come from? In the Bible, it says you are already seated in heavenly places. In layman's terms, you're plugged into this place, and when your body falls dead, where are you now? Guys, I hope this man is in heaven and that there was a change in his life. But you media fellas, the only time you gave him exposure or allowed his books to sell is if you could push him out there to tell everybody in that chair that science says there is no God. Men who believe in science know that the universe has no space for God. The way he would tell you that is out of his one eye that worked. And his chair would allow him to talk to you through his one eye. Our reality is a subset of a much larger, far more complex reality. That it comes from a larger place, not a smaller place. Which is what your current scientists say. That in the beginning, there was nothing, and then it exploded. I don't know how you get the math for that. I come from a little bit of a math background. Now when you're looking at the construct of time, God would be outside of, outside of, greater than, time. If I had, if I took a circuit board, like this board right here, and on one end of the circuit board, I put a big red button, and on the other end of the circuit board, I put a screen, just a digital screen. And then the purpose of the circuit board was to come up with a mathematical equation. So when I hit the button, the circuit's little electrodes would take the time that it takes to go through the circuit board. That could be nanos of a second. And on the other end, boom, it comes up with whatever the answer to the equation is. Well, here's the thing, is that the information that equaled the answer to that equation was available before I hit the button. They gave Stephen Hawkins, Isaac Newton, Sir Isaac Newton, the father of physics, chair, his position, his chair at Cambridge University. That made my heart sink. In the beginning, then there was nothing and it exploded. You are living in an incredibly intelligent and precise place. All of the stars that you see in the heavens above, you're situated in a way specifically where you can look at them. And everything here, coincidentally, goes in circles. And inside that subset of reality, all the biological stuff appears to be built right out of scratch from digital coding, three-dimensional digital coding. And DNA, that is and has always been the living software, the actual biological software of life itself. With Sir Isaac Newton, the father of your modern physics, who stated, if the Bible be true, the time is coming in the future when men shall travel at 50 miles an hour or more. That was Sir Isaac Newton. And the construct of that reality, everything goes round and round, round and round, round and round. If you are looking at space, no matter how one believes that space works, everything here is in circles, going round and round, round and round. And that's no matter what you think is going around what. It goes round and round, round and round, round and round. Just like a test environment on a computer. So, and in these books, you're gonna go through time 
and consciousness and the origin of these things. So inside the base of reality, all of the biological stuff, like you and me and all the plants, have, they have programming code. Coincidentally, inside the blood. Then, just to top that level, underneath the base of it, you've got the quantum particles, just like on a computer program. The ones and zeros, yeses and nos, which make up the base framework of this thing we call reality. And reality appears to have a source, a live stream feeding it. So when you're talking about time, that's the yod back there, the 10, that dangles like a thought between heaven and earth, a number of completion. When you're talking about time, you are never living in the past. You are also never living in the future. No matter when it is, you're always standing on the moment that matters most, the moment that determines everything. No matter when it is, it is always right now. But everything here, including your biblical pages, and most assuredly this set of things, brings the full color life. The fact that you appear to be living in a test. They're all high definition imagery on every single page. So you're going to be taking a journey through the ancient world. This set of things is the beginning of your history. Every single page is high definition images, full glossy, the fronts and the backs are beautiful. Here are the words of Sir Isaac Newton, the father of physics. About the time of the end, a body of men will be raised up who will turn their attention to the prophecies and insist upon their literal interpretation in the midst of much clamor and opposition. Was Isaac Newton. But Berkeley ran these tests. It's called Mitochondrial Eve, a dirty little secret. This was done by Berkeley. And they were looking at mutation rates. Now, by sheer virtue of doing the test alone, where your mutations are errors, the junk in the, that's collecting over time in the code. So by trying to go backwards, to a mutation-free state by sheer virtue of the test. It's like these people don't even think. By sheer virtue of doing the test, you're rewinding to a perfect state. Now what they did to fix the problem, let me tell you the fix, because you read these extensive, very confusing articles in science journals and all this, which is common par for what they did in the Wikipedia page for it, is uh, you could take 10 PhDs and you couldn't screw in a light bulb with what they're saying on those pages. Let me break it down for you like this. They mixed monkey numbers with human numbers to get the numbers that worked for them. Anywhere else that would be considered fraud. But we're in an upside down world, right? So why not? When they looked at the actual real world data, which you can do, you rewind backwards, you find two things, just like the two trees. You find number one, that every race, creed, and color rewinds backwards to a single woman on this planet. That was an unexpected find. That was, they weren't hoping for that, I assure you. But more than that, using the actual data, that woman lived 6,000 years ago. Now you can run from those numbers all you want, but that's what the actual data, no matter what they, they, let them give you convoluted stuff. I'm telling you, I come from a math background, I'm telling you the real numbers, you run the numbers yourself. A mere 6,000 years old. The article titles, and this was in 1998, no need to panic. Fellas, we really do. I'm just being straight with you. We, in a general practical sense, we need the science to step out of fantasy land and make its way back to the world of reality. Charles Darwin was a whiny little 22-year-old that came from a well-to-do family who was trying to find something to even do with him. He had a degree in theology from Oxford. What are you going to do with him? He's got a degree in theology, not any sciences from Oxford University. They'll portray him on walls and things as if he was going on a science expedition on a major ship. Science expedition, that was the HMS Beagle. That stands for Her Majesty's ship. It's a military vessel. He's out there drawing finches and stuff. What I'm telling you is this, he was the only guy on a boat without a job. This is a 22 year old, 150, more than that, years ago, who wrote the basis for all of your sciences by theorizing 
that the Planet of the Apes movies were real, that there was a monkey, that everybody was a, a monkey in his 23 year old view, right? Because he was smarter than everybody else. He died a miserable old man. And his theory not only disagrees with every single written record on earth. So you have to believe that that 22 year old knew better than every single person that had lived before him and every document that they wrote and that they didn't even understand what they were writing in the very hours that they lived in, but instead that there were monkey people. But further than that, one would have to believe that every single science we have from the little cells that we look at in our skin to the stars and the heavens above is wrong. And that that 22 year old from 150 years ago is correct. Everything here is the reverse of Darwin's theory. His theory says things improve over time. Your car parked outside in your drive is not improving over time, nor can it self build itself. Everything here declines over time. Oh, with one exception, except for things that have digital coding, like the entire construct of you is made like a little bitty zip file. A cell combines with an egg and it opens up with complete body plans of digital coding to literally write a human being into reality, birthed into this place, consciously plugged in, and all of it from scratch. So you hardcore atheists guys, I think you're definitely gonna have to leave Manetto's Zeus ruling for 20 years in there for at least that, throwing lightning bolts down at mud puddles to get them to come to life so they can turn into monkeys and monkey people because we all know that if you breed enough monkeys, you obviously get people. I mean, that's scientific, correct? Guys, you find whales in every desert and seashells on every mountain on earth, not monkey men. So when the hardcore occultists of this world today share with me, some of them have and do, that they do their little ceremonies and private rituals or black magic sex parties. That's really what they are involve demonic stuff in their black magic sex parties and things step out of thin air or going all the way back to a murker or nimrod who told me that he summons the inky to step out of this dimensional hole right here right into this place <laughs> well gentlemen take a sip of your brandy in the back room because i believe them in fact let me share with you this I actually, I actually call them, I actually call them the deal cutters. It's impressive. First time you see it, something pop right out of thin air. Well, <laughs> either impressive or it's terrifying. But no matter which, you gotta wonder why something's popping out of thin air to talk or pay attention to you. It's kind of unusual, isn't it? No matter what they're doing, I promise you, they're trying to cut a deal. And those deal cutters always want you to say, certain words. Isn't that strange? It's almost like you're dealing with, I don't know, intelligent uh, snakes. And speaking of snakes, that hops us right back over, back where we started, to the first serpent. Just like the first message to Pharaoh is a snake or the law of first mention right here in Genesis 3, 5. Ye shall be as gods. Now doesn't God himself state, choose this day who you serve? And since this is Manito here that wrote both your bogus and your bad timelines, tells me that, well, right here he states that he likes Enoch. Well, Manito's in luck. I like Enoch too. In fact, it's a long prophecy in the book of Enoch that takes you right through the hours of the pyramid, which are a foreshadowing leading right to the moments that you're living in now and the time period to come of the Antichrist. But right there in the book of Enoch, he's telling you the whole story in advance, but before that flood of the Exodus. I think even Manetho would want me to uh, go ahead and let Enoch share it. 
As much as I like Manitho up there, I think I'm going to have to bail on his timeline and pass on this one. I think we're going to have to be doing some adjustments to his uh, Truth of Thoth timeline in this documentary. Going a step further than, than all of that, and I speak boldly, respectfully, right in a second, right now. <sighs> University and secular guys that have been stating that the Exodus didn't happen, or there was no evidence of the Exodus, and he and have been fighting against the veracity of the Bible, some of you investing your entire lives in it. I know what the source of that is. I want you to know this, and I speak to you boldly, right this second, right here, right through this screen. That all ends right here, right now, and is ending today. And how can an ending be complete without a few fireworks at the ending as we carry this thing out? I want to thank you for watching Pre-Flood by the God in a Nutshell Project. I, my number one goal, above all else, of course, we love it if you buy something from us. We're absolutely, we can actually use it, those that donate to us. My number one thing is that you make it. Even if you don't like me or you disagree with me on nine jillion things, or you think I move my hands weird. Man, make it to heaven. Jesus Christ is real. Even since the beginning, those are, that, that really is, that's the main, that's the number one message of the God in a nutshell things. So, and that's why we put forth this coin has, no matter whether you're a Democrat or Republican, these coins are historic. They have the third temple on them. And on the front is Donald Trump and Cyrus. There's a significant number of us that find real correlations between the two and believe that all of these things, even the presence, before, it's all a leading, a prophecy towards some of the stuff you see on the end, like that third temple there. Joseph, period. That's a Joseph coin. It's made by my friend Mike Hughes. He went to Egypt with me. He's done support a lot of biblical projects over the years. That's Joseph on that coin right there. And on the back is the temple. That's the temple that made the prosper of all of Egypt. Little guy right here. This is just, just a foreshadowing of where we're coming up to. The next video, full-length video, is going to be Nimrod. The next video on this set. We might put up other things between them. But here's the Inky right there. Stepping through on this tablet, his little dimensional doorway. We're going to be talking a lot about that in Nimrod. The book's already available with the book Exodus. I've turned the donation pages back on at GodInTheNutshell.com. We can actually use your, your help and support. The next sets of things that we've got coming out that we're working on right now are um, the actual movies, Exodus and Nimrod. Those are both coming next. So, and you can get the God in a nutshell. You can get the God in a nutshell from any, any device that you have, your home computer, your iPad, your laptop. Here it is on a laptop right here. This is what God in a nutshell looks like. You can go over to the donate section and make a donation if you want by simply clicking that button there or to find the books, the coins, old DVDs of God in a nutshell, all of that. And we've got sections in here that have videos that are not on YouTube. Right in here, you can click shop. And you just scroll down to whatever it is that wets your whistle, and it'll be right in there. So there's the shop section. Even that looks beautiful. I always like it when the stuff looks, looks gorgeous. So this is the entire set available at God in a nutshell, Barnes and Noble, Amazon, any Walmart, anywhere books are sold. So we've got some excellent writers over at God in a Nutshell. One in particular that's an incredible writer. We could use some more writers over at God in a Nutshell. Our shipping has gotten a lot better over the years. And also, there are a few private things that I'm working on. We could use some programmers. If there's some talented programmers here, you know somebody, please write to us. I'd like to talk about some special projects we're thinking about at God in a Nutshell. As the sun goes down over the mountains of Colorado, you're looking at a trifecta of probably the best that God in a Nutshell has ever done. And these may well be some of the most unusual books in the world. Do a review of them. I'm Trey Smith. God bless every last one of you. Every last one of you. And your families. On the other side of the screen.
beautiful.